Aloha, and welcome to What's Bugging You, brought to you by Hawaii's leader in pest control and the first company in Hawaii to earn the National Quality Pro Certification, Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Now, here's the host of our show, Mike Buck. Yep, and a pesty, pesty little fellow I am. Uh, welcome uh, back. If this is the first time you've been with us, this is a weekly show brought to you in the in the public interest by Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. We call the show What's Bugging You. It's way more than just something bothering you. And today's show is going to be really different. Not only are we going to talk about bugs and pests and things, but we're going to talk about tropical diseases and other problems. It's not just a matter of inconvenience and having to swat a cockroach. I mean, some of these things can make you pretty sick. And how do you keep your summer pest at bay? We're going to find that out. It's, uh, joining us, as always, the uh, owner and president of Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions, Michael Botha. Um, and I guess, you know, over the years, you've got, you know, you you just say, oh, this guy, what a pest this guy is. That's what you do. You're in, in the pest control business, you know, yeah. I- am I right? Uh, it, it's This is not an inconvenience or something to be afraid about, scared about. Uh, this is something that can be damaging to your health, particularly for little kids. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll, we'll be talking in the show, we'll talk about the various different types of tropical diseases which are caused by pests. And uh, we'll talk about the thing that's really in the news a lot lately too, which is invasive species. Now, I, I imagine that some of them can do with your health as well. I mean, sometimes an invasive species, that's correct. and you can explain this, would be really damaging to the flora and fauna of a region if it didn't have any enemies, right? That's right. So uh, Hawaii, being that it's so isolated, is very vulnerable to invasive species infestations. And uh, mostly because... Any pest that comes in here is probably not going to have a predator. And yeah, you know why? Because we don't have any apex predators in Hawaii, do we? we that, that's know, right. Yeah, and, no, and, no squirrels, no snakes, no And many, many of the insects that we have have evolved in Hawaii in a protected environment. They haven't had to ev- evolve to um, survive against other types of preying insects uh, or diseases. Mm. So when something new comes into the environment, they have no defense against it and can easily be wiped out. Okay, now one thing that you did say is, and we're trying to mark where these things come from. Um, Now, obviously, some things, if they float here on the ocean in a coconut or something, that's how we got everything, right? That's right. That's that's is that an invasive species? Is that normal? But by wind, by sea, Mm -hmm. and uh, by man, I guess. Yeah, by or airborne, you know, by bird. That's it. Yeah, Yeah, by bird. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so so the, the stuff that's here originally was all invasive species. Well, not invasive. So what mm. makes something invasive is that it has to cause harm to either oh, human or okay. animal health. So okay. there's a different thing with, with, uh, between invasive and uh, an alien species or um, some type of species that's come to the, the island that isn't actually causing harm. So a good example of this is, for example, the rock wallabies. Okay. So Probably everyone's heard about that yeah, small... Yeah, that little tiny thing, right? I, I don't know if you call thing. it a herd, but, yeah. <laughs> but there's a group of them that live yeah. in the Kalihi Valley. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had heard that there were some down by Diamond Head too. Not Diamond Head, but uh, um, Makapu'u side. Okay, Coco Head. Yeah. 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 And uh, anyway, so those are an alien species that were introduced, but they're not invasive because they don't cause harm to either humans or the animals or the environment. And are they good? Can, would they eat bad guys? We, not, what are we don't know what they honestly, I don't know probably not very much. Them, they, they they're tiny much. little things. Yeah, yeah. they're tiny little things, and, and they've been here for almost a hundred years, though. Yeah, yeah. And there's been no um, negativity uh, as a result of them being here. So. But you know what I was alarmed at when I saw some of the material you sent me. Um, we have we're getting literally deluged or barraged by these things all the time. You, you mentioned Maui specifically. Yeah. So the the Hawaii Department of Agriculture they have a quarantine branch. And their purpose is to intercept shipments coming in, like they did recently where they identified that Brazilian wandering spider spider. in the stone shipments in Hawaii, uh, on Oahu. Well, in Maui, they actually did a um, a sampling. They inspected 100% of everything coming in, Mm -hmm. and they found an average of one insect species per day. You know, in the in the in, that if you we do don't the math, have in yeah, I was going to say yeah. if you do the math, that's an awful lot. Well, yeah. we supposedly uh, scientists believe that Hawaii has five hundred times the rate of introduction of invasive species than does any other state in America. Can we blame tourists for some of it? They bring stuff to us. Um, sure, I, I yeah. think you can blame yeah. them, but not from the point of view of them doing it on purpose. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we just oh, as no, likely yeah. to introduce things when we when we visit Vegas or wherever we go. Well, when we talk about things like bed bugs and stuff, which we'll touch on later, um, they they can be brought in by somebody completely not knowing they're doing it. But aren't we more liable with large things being shipped 
furniture, yeah. you know, big stuff. So the example recently was the one from Brazil where basically you imagine this, you're loading a 40-foot container and it's in a shipyard somewhere in, in and South America. And there's millions of them, yeah. And uh, there's all kinds of bugs and creatures mm. crawling around. So they, they, they pick up some lumber line around and they build a framing to keep the stones or whatever mm-hmm. it might be from shifting around. And so it's usually untreated lumber. Bugs in them. And uh, then they uh, ship it off. And when it gets intercepted in Hawaii and they identify a type of a pest, well, then we've got to deal with it. And so in, in that particular yeah. case, the, the best solution was actually to ship them out of the state because there was no viable um, mm. treatment. And it was the most poisonous spider in the world. You know, you actually pointed out a, a, on another program, uh, the problem is not necessarily killing them. But killing their babies and killing their eggs, and you gotta you gotta keep going back and treating it. You can't just say one stop fixes all. You know? that, that's yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. So we were talking about bed bugs earlier, <clears throat> and uh, the, the the one reason that bed bugs have really prevailed and have become such a big problem is because you have to control the eggs, mm-hmm. and uh, until you can control the eggs, and until recently many pesticides did not penetrate that egg capsule. Uh, so until you control the eggs, you can't control the, 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 the insect because yeah, it's it, like it trying breeds to open, so rapidly. It's, it's like trying to open a coconut with your hands, right? It's hard to get inside those things. <laughs> but, right. you know, Michael, there's another thing. Uh, I, I learned from you a long time ago that these things have a long uh, period where they can do without. In other words, a bed bug, you would think would have to eat somebody, eat human blood every day. But, no, they can, they can be, what, months without having well, something to eat? Su- suppose they can last up to a year. But oh. from, from our yeah. personal experience, we yeah. actually raise bed bugs. Mm-hmm. And uh, like I told you before, whoever doesn't pay the bill, we just got ship the bed bugs. Got the little bed bug circus <laughs> no, for you. I'm just yeah, kidding. Yeah. But when we had yeah. our, our canine scent detection division mm-hmm. with our canines, mm-hmm. uh, we have dogs that have to detect bed bugs. So we had to have a constant supply of all the various different life stages of bed bugs, from eggs to nymphs to there's five instars. So there's like five miniature versions of the adult and then the adult. And so we had to have all of those different life stages for daily training. So it was easier for us to just raise them. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we purposefully didn't feed a group for six months, and they lasted six months happily. No problem Jeez. at all. And you know what dawned on me, and this must be because y- you guys are the go-to people. When somebody have a pest, somebody have a problem, first thing they do is to go to sandwichisle.com or call you up. Uh, four five six seven seven one six and say hey, help me. Does it sometimes? Uh, are you sometimes amazed that we don't have more trouble because we just don't have enough people to inspect everything? We can't stay on top of everything for whatever the reason. Are we? Are we lucky? I think we are. You yeah. know, um, I I honestly believe that if they capture a hundred percent, if they captured a hundred percent, well, they inspected a hundred percent of the containers and identified one invasive insect. Yeah. Every day. Now. How many shipments are not being checked every yeah, year? Yeah, really. And it's not that they're not doing their job. It's just that maybe they're understaffed. And and uh, I don't think it's realistic to say that you could inspect everything coming into the state. Yeah. It's just not possible. Yeah, and, you know, it's not sexy. I mean, you know, you don't, you can't get people really bothered because it's they don't see it. They don't know it. Uh, the, the one that comes to mind to me is you talk about invasive species. Let's be sure people understand uh, health or environment. Aren't termites an invasive species then? Because they eat wood, they eat our houses. That's up. right. Yeah. Formosan termites are yeah. listed yeah. as an invasive species. Yeah. They come from China, and they cause unbelievable structural damage. And some estimates over a hundred million dollars a year of yeah. structural yeah. damage in Hawaii alone. It's not a matter of so, what is a minute. So, it's when. Yeah. So yeah. you know, talking about the spiders though. So <clears throat> as it turns out, Hawaii is probably the best location for spiders to live. That means we, we're lucky because we don't, I know we have a lot, but we don't have a, a lot of the bad guys yet. Well, yeah. the, th- the thing, we've been lucky. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing about it is, is what do spiders do? They, they eat other insects yeah. primarily. And because we have this beautiful summer year round, um, insects can breed year round yeah, in Hawaii. Yeah. And so we already have um, black widows, brown widows. We have um, the, um, uh, what are they called? The violin spiders. And uh, we have cane spiders. We have the little crab spiders, which are the ones that bite like crazy. Yeah, and you know, especially on the big island, you you, see a lot of them. You told me one thing that not all spiders have webs. They're webless spiders. They don't need a web. Yes, cane spiders is a good example. Yeah, they don't. They don't get their food the same way other spiders. spiders. They yeah. they they active at night and they just go looking for prey and they jump on and attach it. So they actually don't. They don't live in webs at all. How big do they get? We've seen some pretty big cane spiders. I'm not sure what the record is, but I, I've seen some that must span at least four inches. Uh, it's, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and, and, and it's just a, how creepy make, they are. That they. makes a grown man jump off on a chair. <laughs> Yeek! See, it's it. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about this week. I mean, we, we try to get everybody sort of up to date on what's going on. Um, I played uh, as the, as the 
uh, opening theme music of the show today, I played our, the chicken dance. Yeah, quite, uh, a, quite chi- appropriate as it turns chickens out. Chickens can be kind of a problem, can't they? Yeah, so chickens yeah. have really been in the news a lot lately. There's the, the state has been dealing with this quandary on, on how to deal with uh, chickens on public areas. Mm-hmm. And uh, perhaps as a result of that, um, we looked at our leads and, and identified that pigeons and chickens were um, two of the most uh, common causes for calls to mm-hmm. our company this last week. And uh, so pigeons primarily in the Honolulu area, yep. chickens statewide. We've got people calling from all the different islands asking about what you can do about chickens. You know, I got one question about that, and that is on how you catch them. It's just so ironic because we talked about the, you know, the, the, man, the uh, Pacquiao and, and Mayweather fight and all of this stuff and boxers. And I remember the Rocky we talked about on another show when the trainer was training Rocky to catch a chicken with one hand tied behind his back. <laughs> uh, how do you guys catch these, these things? Chickens, I guess, are, are a little easier than, say, pigeons. I mean, you walk up to a pigeon, it flies away. How do you catch them? Well, um, the key thing with any type of uh, animal trapping, live animal trapping, is, and, and that's all we do is live animal trapping, mm-hmm. is that you have to treat the animal in a humane and ethical manner, yeah. which means that when you have a trap, you're obligated to, to check that trap at least once a day. Amen. Yeah, because I get you it. Yeah. never want to have a trapped animal yeah. inside a trap yeah. unnecessarily long. So the other key components to trapping are you have to provide shade. Hawaii is hot. If mm-hmm. you're in the sun in Hawaii, you can you know it can be over 100 degrees in certain sure. areas if there's no wind. And so you have to have a shade cloth, you have to have water, and you have to have food inside the trap, and you have to check it daily. And so we have all kinds of humanely designed traps mm-hmm. so that there's no pain inflicted on the animal when they, when they trap it. Most of them have like a little trip wire or a, a trip plate that as they walk over to get water or food, it will close the gate behind them. How, how about uh, reminding everybody how you've stayed on the cutting edge technology-wise? You're able to maintain observance on, on a lot of things at one time now because of uh, little cameras and little, and little things that can show you what's going on on the site. Yeah, basically game cameras, yeah. uh, which we've, had, we've customized, and now they're highly specialized, mm-hmm. are able to take video or still pictures and send them to us via text. And there's a new development that we've got, which is actually working on our chicken traps. We're actually experimenting with a new um, device, which is much cheaper than text. It doesn't yeah. use up so much data. But when the chicken when the chicken trap closes, it actually sends out a little text message. So, okay, trap number 23, That's closed. That's fantastic. <laughs> I, I knew you were going to say that. I just so, I read uh, in your mind. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Because I want to really quickly, I want to spend one second on this. You've developed and devised a real humane way to help people get rid of, 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 of feral pigs. And, right. and, and that is you feed them, you feed them, you feed them, and then the door comes on and you catch them all, but you know you caught them. That's right. It's yeah. all The key thing that I, that I prefer to do with animal trapping mm. versus, say, snaring or yeah. some type of That's pretty trap. Loose you know, snaring, you, you yeah. never know when something's trapped. Mm-hmm. This way, a human always makes the decision yeah. as to when to close the trap. Like with our pig uh, mm-hmm. trapping, we know when the pig's in there and we make the decision to trap it, not, not the pig. So we can trap them on our schedule. I'm in such an in, a, a instant gratification <laughs> kind of a guy. If I saw one pig in the trap, I go close it. But what you said was, if there's several in the family, you kind of saw you put food in there for several days, and then you can maybe you can get the whole family all at once, and then and and then dispatch with them in the proper way. Yeah, you know, just yeah. Y- utilizing the same integrated pest management concept that you'd use for say German cockroaches or bed bugs. Uh, for example, cockroaches. If you just swat yeah. one at a time, would you solve the problem? The Not answer, really. The answer Not is really. no. Yeah. So what you have to do is you have to break the breeding cycle, which is why in German cockroach control, which is the most prevalent cockroach in restaurants and kitchens, um, you have to use insect growth regulators or mm-hmm. hormones that are mixed in with the active ingredient that kills them on site so that when the active ingredient is gone, there's still this hormone in place which prevents them from going from one stage to the next, one life cycle. So the same principle is applied in pig management sure you have to take down the entire source so you capture the entire breeding family because if you in hawaii um i think the dnr did a study a few years ago and they identified you had to remove 70 percent of the population seven zero seven zero wow to maintain the population yeah just to keep it out yeah yeah, that's not reducing it too too bad that doesn't work too good in fishing you know because if you take 70 (laughs) percent you got nothing left but interestingly enough last week we talked a little bit about this uh, and, and since we're going to be doing this, and since it's a weekly show, let's give them the update on swarming. Because uh, last week or the week before that, the swarms were just out of control. It was yeah. just really, really Interestingly, heavy. Interestingly, two weeks ago, we had unbelievable dry wood termite swarms. Mm-hmm. But surprisingly, no Formosan termites. So Formosan termites are the subterranean termites that cause the most amount of damage. Well, <clears throat> when they swarm, what they're actually doing is 
there are kings and queens, future kings and queens, who fly out mm -hmm. and hopefully meet another king or queen, and then they crawl into a dark little space start and a uh, start a colony. So wow. that, that's, that's, those are the primary reproductors. Mm -hmm. That's how colonies are started. And uh, we had very, very strong Formosan termite swarms last, uh, last week, mm -hmm. and mostly in the Honolulu area. So that's where we got most of the reports from. Um, we still forecast that 2015 is going to be one of the largest termite swarm years. Yeah. We found that uh, in the last 21, almost 22 years that I've been here, I've observed that swarms go through like a five to seven year cycle. Right. Where we're in the sixth, sixth year now of a cycle where they're really, really strong. And so I think this yeah. year is going to be a boom boom uh, swarm uh, year Now, again. that being said, I mean, and what that certainly does is call our awareness to it because exactly you see right. it. But does it actually increase the amount of damage being done at the same time? Not at all. In mm -hmm. fact, um, those termites... They're out flying around instead of eating wood. <clears throat> they're just... Uh, some years, it yeah. seems like more of them swarm than others. Mm -hmm. And uh, so termites are in Hawaii are active year-round. Yeah. They don't, yeah, they don't you know, have a wintering session. Michael has pointed out before, folks, it, it's not a matter of complete uh, extermination. It, yeah, it does. The tents kills everything. The chemicals kill everything. But it's management. You, you just have to expect that, okay, when it gets really bad, you get them, you get them all, and then you start getting them all again pretty soon. Just like you do at your home. You have sure. an annual inspection. Sure. You have the uh, termite baiting program in the ground, the centricon pr yep. baiting program. And what you're doing there is you're preventing new colonies that move in from mm -hmm. becoming established. You're checking to make sure that you know what you've got. And uh, you solve the problems when you get them. So that that's the key thing with, with termite control is you have to know what you've got. You have to do an annual inspection, and you have to have some sort of reoccurring yeah. protection. Sure. My, now, my system, the Centricon system I've had for at least a decade in, in longer in this house, um, I, do, I do know that you keep changing the way it worked. I mean, originally, right. you, you know, it, it, the, the stuff that you put in them <laughs> isn't the same now as it was then. What, 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 what goes in the ground now? That's right. So basically, and this goes back. 24 years yeah, ago, been, I was the lab assistant for Dr. Nanya oh, Su in Florida in the very at the University of, of Florida. Oh. And what my job was is going to the Everglades and capture termites, get logs filled with mm -hmm. subterranean termites that they'd bring into research for this new bait they were trying to develop. Okay, that, which turned out to be the Centricon bait. That bake. became Centricon. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been involved in it from before it was actually a product. Anyway, so Dow AgroScience is the company that, that owns the patent for it. Mm -hmm. They're constantly trying to innovate and find ways to – uh, improve the product and so they've gone through a few different variations of the insect growth regulating hormone mm -hmm. which is what the active ingredient is it's not a pesticide it's actually a hormone yep. it only affects subterranean termites when they go through their molting cycle ah, so imagine okay. they're walking through their sandy little environment mm -hmm. getting sanded down every day essentially sure the exoskeleton wears out and so they have to molt to get a new exoskeleton otherwise they'll just break break apart and so it's through that process of molting that the hormone works. It allows them to molt, but it doesn't allow them to harden. So they come out ah, of the molt and they're like, jelly. they're like jelly. And then yeah. they just fall apart. Wow. And it kills hey. the entire colony. Now, now, that's the good news. But the bad news is you probably got some, and we'll tell you about them as we continue. And remember, you can always find out more at sandwichisle.com. That's sandwichisle.com. Michael Bolton and I will be right back. Why do you need pest prevention? My home is very important to me. The last thing I want to worry about are bugs and centipedes around my wife and kids. Your home is your castle. Our customers want to keep their homes free of unwanted pests. That's why they hire Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. There are many homes out there that are going to get rodents. We used to live in fear of centipedes and roaches. You need to protect your house, and Sandwich Isle protects ours. That's Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Expect more and get it. Why do you need termite protection? My home is very important to me. Your home is your castle. My home is everything to me. Our customers want to protect their investment. That's why they hire Sandwich Isle to protect their home from termites. There are some homes out there that are going to get termites. You can spend thousands and thousands of dollars to repair damage. You need to protect your house, and Sandwich Isle protects ours. That's Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Expect more and get it. Oh, yeah, just like that. Okay, uh, you know, actually, we're here for you. And we want you to know that you can contact us, not just uh, through uh, through my program here on KHNR, but you can go to sandwichisle.com and hit the contact us button. And if you want to hear something on the show, if you want to get something answered, you got some kind of a weird problem going on at your house, you uh, you drop it to us in an email and we'll get to it in a future program. Today, uh, we talked a little bit about our, our swarm report. But, you know, one of the things that we always talk about is people. 
And one of the things that I've come to know is that you guys have a very, very strict procedure and a protocol for joining the company. And I do know that you have some openings right now. Tell us about them. Yeah, so as as we grow, we're constantly seeking to find new people. And, and I think we mentioned in the last show how difficult it is to actually find people that mm-hmm. qualify across all all the um, checking of abstracts and so on. So we, we presently have termite and pest control uh, service specialist positions. Mm-hmm. We have customer service positions. A lot of people don't realize how big the pest management industry is and and, and the types of jobs that you can get. Yeah. Most well, people you know, think in, you just in, sprain in, something. But in, in many respects, Michael, it's very much like agriculture. I mean, you know, if yeah. you're a laborer, you don't see the big picture. But what you're saying is that the people that come to you, and you've, got, you've had some that have been in your company since employee number one, right after you were the only guy. Uh, That's right. Th- there's, a, there's a future there. And when you work for a company like yours, you go through this learning process, which gives you a model uh, to decide, number one, if this is for you. And then number two, what what part of the uh, industry do you want to learn about to uh, to be com- more just, proficient? In? And that's it. There's just so many different components. There's marketing. There's sales. There's management. There's training. There's quality assurance. There's the service side of it, which is the obviously how we earn our money. And then there's human resources. So there's just so many fantastic opportunities. And and actually, we have interns as well. So um, anyway, if if you know, if, I got to ask you a question. I know that you have a very very distinct. Uh, protocol for your the behavior and appearance and everything of all the employees. Uh, recently, we've seen a whole lot of stuff. We're gonna, there's soon going to be dispensaries for medical marijuana, and I do know that there's some people that are actually going to be prescribed this. I, I think it's kind of a slippery slope in some respects. Uh, how how would you handle something like that if this it came is a, up? Mike, this is a really difficult question, yeah. and um, you know I'm, I'm in a various number of different associations with other Hawaii businessmen, and I ask them the same question: you know, What do we do in this situation where mm. we've got an obligation to have safe drivers to yeah. enter into people's homes? We're working on step ladders, we're working on roofs. Uh, we have an obligation to all yeah. of our employees, not just the ones that that want to take medical marijuana. And so, uh, you know, the bottom line is this: a company has its own drug policy, and in our case, we have a drug-free mm. policy, which means that. Uh, you have to agree to a drug test whenever there's a reason for it, yep. um, and uh, whether it's it's um, a reasonable cause or if it's a random. And if you fail the drug test, you don't have a job. Yeah, and, and you know, and I, I, I really get it, and, and I respect you for for coming out right out of the bat and having that position because uh, it it it's probably no surprise to some that for some they actually need that stuff, and I have no problem with it. But there's no question that there's the jury's out on whether you get impaired or not. And if you're taking right. medical marijuana for glaucoma or whatever, <clears throat> and if you're loaded and driving a, a company truck, you get in an accident, they're coming right after the company. Well, that, the, and, and as a company owner, you have an obligation to make sure you've done your mm. due diligence and you've trained people yeah. and you know with confidence that every person driving the truck or vehicle, whatever it might be, or yeah. doing the job, isn't going to be impaired in any way. You have an obligation. And so the fact that medical marijuana might be legal mm-hmm. doesn't, remove that obligation for a proper, yeah. for a business owner. Yeah, it's a difficult it's a, position. It, it is a difficult yeah. thing. Well, I'm glad that we at least addressed it. But that uh, leads to other things. I mean, obviously, you want to make sure that people are, if they're going to be wearing the Sandwich Isle T-shirt, uh, they're going to they're going to be for, I got. By the way, I must tell you that this is an important thing. I want to tell you how often I'm driving around and seeing the vehicles on the road. And yeah. that reminds me to tell everybody that as a businessman, you have some really good ideas about what we should and shouldn't do about traffic because we got some issues. Well, we're probably contributing to because I just picked up truck number 109 yesterday. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> but um, 109. No, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. the traffic is a nightmare. Yeah. We, we, we literally meet weekly with our guys. We've yeah. had people quit in the last yeah. two weeks because of traffic. Yeah. They just refuse to do it. They, 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 you know, it's so hard for employees to drive in traffic all day. Yeah. And, and then they've got a, a route that they've got to meet. And so we constantly meet trying to find better ways to overcome this problem. And we're actually going to a remote type check-in system whereby... Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because you're so technology advanced on, on your competition and in the field and on, on the... What about that as far as being able to make sure that a route is as concise and precise as it can be, that you're not sending the guy from Kahuku to Wai, to Wailaika Hala and all that stuff? You know? So in, in the service business in general, mm-hmm. utility is about the most important thing. Okay. And that is the, 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 the measurement of time. How many hours is, is an employee in front of a customer mm-hmm. earning billable time versus how much time did they work for the day? Total hours yeah. worked for the day. So, for example, an employee who works six hours in front of a customer um, and he worked for eight hours, his utility is, uh, you yeah. know, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So th- that that's good. But now when you get traffic, suddenly it's four hours 
yeah. of, of work time and four hours of utility time. So we're thinking about ways to increase that again. And so what we've come up with is basically we've GPSed all our vehicles. Mm-hmm. We have moved all of our paperwork to handhelds, which are yeah. GPS and barcoded. All of our devices are barcoded and our locations are barcoded. And what we do now is we're going to have service managers meet guys in the areas that they live in yeah. and meet in the mornings um, at a Starbucks yeah. or whatever it might be in the field so they don't come yeah. to the office and then they go straight to the field and the guy will check in with them at the end of the day in the field rather than ha- everyone come to the office. You know, if you're a business person, I know that Michael's time is pretty hammered, but if you go through the process uh, of getting in touch, I think that this is a probably pretty good model for a lot of other things. And I know that you've been forced to develop models uh, of, of procedures that aren't there. You make them there because that's, it, it's all about, you know, you talk about losing somebody for traffic. What if that's a great, good, valued employee that's been with you for years? It was a great valued employee. Yeah. It was one of my best guys, but yeah. he was an older guy. Mm-hmm. And he just decided, you know, that this wasn't for him anymore. Yeah, yeah. He, was, he didn't want to drive around in traffic all day. And I so mean, you quit. know, a guy driving a limo or a cab, they, they expect it, right? Yeah. But even them, I was talking to a friend of mine that has a little limo service from the airport. He is extremely impacted by traffic. Can't get to, he can't pick up a client on time. I can't get him to the plane on time. There's all kinds of issues. Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it, it's a terrible thing, you know. And we, we talk about the we ask the question to the industry. Uh, the National Pest Management Association does mm-hmm. all kinds of annual industry reports, and we've asked people how they how they adapted to this. Yeah. And a lot of it, uh, interestingly, a buddy of mine runs one of the largest companies in New York City. And do you know that he owns like three trucks? But he does about, I think it's close to $40 million a year. But he has three trucks. And his guys don't even drive. I was going to say, they what are they the doing? Yeah. They go in tubes. Yeah. And they, they have different locations in the buildings mm-hmm. where they have a vertical marketplace, basically. Yeah. So the guy's route won't be in a geographic area. It's in It'll a building. In, in, and it goes from top to bottom. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, really and, you know, that, that is... <laughs> entrepreneurship at its highest acme as really taking you know a lemon and making lemonade yeah you know uh, but you know unfortunately that's not going to be the case with sandwich i'll best solutions because you guys are coming to our houses yeah it's a it's yeah, a challenge yeah, that yeah, we will overcome yeah, yeah, yeah or we won't be around okay you know, now well, if you're with us earlier uh we try to zero in on something every day and uh, we're going to spend uh, some some time today talking about the diseases and other problems uh health associated problems uh, with pests, uh, most of us know that bugs and things are dirty, evil, awful things. Uh, some of them we need, some of them we don't. Uh, wh- why did this come up? What are, what are tropical diseases that are pest-related? So tropical diseases are diseases that are prevalent in tropical areas. Mm-hmm. Generally speaking, um, they're in tropical areas because there's a proliferation of pests, mostly flies and mosquitoes. Yep. And those pests become vectors of these diseases. And the way that it works is typically the, the diseases are transmitted to human beings or animals through the process of an insect biting and an injecting fluids into that person or yep. just the saliva or the proboscis going in. And that's generally how it happens. Okay. Now, one of the things that I'm very concerned about is as we overpopulate certain parts of the island and the state, um, that we're putting people in proximity with more and more pests. You know, I mean, if, if, if it used to be the pests are all out in the country uh, or it, it, where there's standing water and you don't have any, now your neighbor does, all of a sudden, somebody two doors away from you is sending you, t- uh, you know, uh, yeah, that's right. mosquito disease. So, for example, deforestation, which is not a big problem in Hawaii, but in mm-hmm. other areas of the world, deforestation is a big problem. And and uh, people reclaiming marshlands and that kind of thing. And so that that's where those areas were typically inhabited with, with all kinds of mosquitoes and flies. And then people come to close proximity, yeah. and then that's how they that's how they spread. And then we all travel. So today, people yeah. travel all over the world. Mm-hmm. And so dengue fever, you know, that, that was introduced because of someone traveling to Tahiti, I believe. Yeah, and can you so, imagine that? And, and it didn't take very many. No. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm concerned about one thing. You mentioned earlier, and this is a very big thing, particularly if you are a recent addition to Hawaii. Um, you're experiencing pest problems here that didn't exist where you were. And primarily, Michael, you explained it because... If you really have four seasons, you have four seasons of pests. In Hawaii, we got summer and almost summer. That's, that's know, right. Yeah, so we have yeah. year-round pest control, so, mm-hmm. so pest um, pressure. So on the mainland, for example, mm-hmm. many pests are forced to go into an overwintering mode during the cold season. So, mm-hmm. so oh, Like um, hibernation kind of a thing almost? Yeah, hibernation, yeah, yeah, because yeah. The other, if, they, if they were active, they would freeze to death outside. So in areas where it gets below freezing, they can't survive in wintertime doing the same things they did in summertime. So mm-hmm. they go into hibernation, which cuts the population back because they're not breeding during that time. 
The difference is in the tropic areas, um, they don't go into hibernation. And so well, they, they may slow down slightly yeah. during the few, few weeks in the cold months, but generally speaking, they'll reproduce throughout the year. You know, I, I got to tell you something, and you can reflect on your experience with the state of Montana that you have affinity for. I can remember when I was up in Alaska. If you're up there, uh, you know, in the wintertime and you go hunting or something, the only things you see are the things you're hunting. There are no bugs. I mean, it is, like, wonderful. And then in the summertime, it's like the uh, the Alaskan state bird is a mosquito. They're huge. That's unreal, And yeah. they, th- where do they go? I mean, how do they how do they stay dormant for as long as they do? Well, it's amazing. You yeah. know, um, all animals, especially insects, are, to, to survive, they have to take advantage of every situation possible. Mm-hmm. So it's amazing. There, some of those insects over there only have a few weeks during the year in which to breed. Yeah, that's it. You know, it's, yeah. it's crazy. And so when they when they breed, there's just gazillions of them. So I know what you're talking about. Yeah. They they just uh, um, they overwinter for you know ten months <laughs> or eight months. Yeah. And then that four month window, they're, they're just everywhere. Have you seen seasonal differences in Montana of what sort of pests are out there? Yeah, and it's interesting you brought up Montana. So as you know, I have a cabin out uh, yeah, there. Yeah, that's why I asked. And yeah. uh, um, just today, I got my uh, approval that that, that I passed all the state exams to open up Big Sky Pest Solutions. Oh, no, there you, isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Big Sky Pest Solutions. Of course, your your nearest neighbor is probably fifty Rydale. miles away or something. But you know, but yeah. that's for that that is very interesting that, that, yeah. that because people in different areas have different concerns, right? But it's still big that's concerns. Right. Yeah. So you know, as an example, in a place like that, you don't have much pest pressure. You don't see cockroaches. Mm-hmm. You don't really see ants around outside, except in the in the woodsy areas, and uh, there's very little pest pressure as we know it. Um, mm-hmm. What they do have a lot of is rodents, and uh, you oh, know they yeah. have rodents and squirrels and and um, marmots. And so, mm-hmm. as, as an example, um, one of my neighbors had seventy thousand dollars damage done to to his, it's a it's now a, you're talking wow yeah, so yeah, a, yeah a real nice cabin more like a lodge mm-hmm. but he doesn't live there either so he just leaves it and comes back you know mm-hmm. every six months or so and uh, squirrels came inside <laughs> started a nest and then uh, some type of marmot came in that eats squirrels. And he tore the squirrels no, you got up. A battle, a battle in your cabin. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, it was yeah. just uh, first it was all the damage, then it was all the dead bodies. You probably, thought, all he'd the been, probably thought he'd been looted, you know. <laughs> yeah, but you so. know, the, the thing is that that must mean, particularly if you have kids, that certain times of the year they're going to be less susceptible to parasites and bugs because there are none. But That's talk right. about what these things bring. I mean, on a typical day, you, you mentioned flies and mosquitoes. Yeah. Don't these things, if they're eating on something dead and then they come into your house now, they got some stuff on them that can be transferred to you just as bad as a bite? Yeah, so they, they carry parasites, mm-hmm. uh, bacteria, and viruses. And how those are transmitted is by most of these insects, particularly mosquitoes, um, they have what it are, it's, it's called a proboscis, which is like a little, yeah, like sword, a little dart or something. Almost, yeah. But it's, it has a yeah. component where it can squirt stuff out of. And so they'll inject, oh, okay, the, okay. They'll inject the proboscis into you, and then they'll siphon out the blood. Okay. okay. Well, the saliva... Pretty efficient. They're pretty efficient. Yeah, they have they? saliva yeah. that um, they, they put down there that... Have you ever noticed a mosquito's on you for a while, and then you hit it and there's a blood stain? Oh, yeah. Because it was there for a while. And you, you wonder, is that my blood or somebody else's? It's because I mean, it anesthetized you. Know what anesthetized Ah, so that's why you don't feel it mm. because it kind of desensitizes the skin as it's sucking your blood, and only afterwards it's pretty starts smart. Like crazy. They, they they deaden it so they can eat. That's right. And then they, by the time it hurts, they're gone. They're out of there. Yeah, geez. And and so anyway, it, it's during that process of sticking the proboscis in and taking it out and feeding that they they are, so they vector these diseases mm. and then they transmit them into the blood. I did get an email from somebody that said the next time you get a chance of talking about things that bite, please ask Michael Botha about ticks and fleas, particularly on our animals. Uh, dogs, uh, once they get that tick yeah, thing going, a, it's a pretty big problem. That's a that's a yeah. that's a great uh, that's a great question, and I'll, I'll tell you. Um, Can they hurt people too? The ticks? Yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah. when I was a kid, I, I had a really severe case of uh, it's called African tick bite fever. Oh my! And I was a kid, and I got it from dog ticks, and basically. Mm-hmm. In, in in my case, it bit me on the back of my my head mm-hmm. in my hairline, and I was sick for about four weeks or so. Wow. And finally, um, yeah. the, the doctors like, man, we got to figure this out. No one knew what it was, and they shaved my head, and they found the head of the tick had almost been grown over with skin in the back of my Gee, head, was, yeah. and, and that, that was the cause of it. Um, but you know, in, in America, Lyme disease, L Y M E, right, is a yeah. is a tick borne disease, mm-hmm. and that is a major problem. Yeah, and so uh, we're very fortunate that in Hawaii we don't we don't have Lyme disease. You know, I did talk to one guy that that, that was warning some people about going to the dog parks because you know y- you don't know what the dog next to your dog's got on them. And, yeah. and and I guess there are, is a concern about that, but but I know just like you have treatment for, you know, the homes that you do. What about treatment for people that have, 
you know, a physical problem with these yeah, bites. Ticks, fortunately, the, our ticks are not problematic to humans here. I mm-hmm. think it's the brown dog tick that we have. Right. Um, but ticks sure are relatively dogs, easy to things. take care of. Yeah. And so the, the key thing with uh, dogs is uh, for fleas or ticks is that you have to give them – the best way to do it is to give them some type of pill mm-hmm. um, or s- something systemic so that when the insects – bite on them they actually die so please that's explain one the- please explain this michael because i know a lot of people out there dog people we talk about you know feral dogs and cats and but we talk about pets and we love our pets uh how how important it is for these things to wear those collars or, or get that in in our in my dogs we have two golden retrievers as you know um our guys they get that once a month treatment of revolution on the back of their okay uh, neck and it's it, they've been tick and flea free for for years that's awesome so yeah, i yeah. you know i i my experience has been that the best solution is some, taking something systemic or mm-hmm. if it's a surface type oil yeah. like that, um, that, that works great too. But if you have them, you need to do something. Yeah. And so um, just bathing your dog isn't going to do it. You, you have to bath it with a flea and tick medicated yeah. shampoo. Uh, you have to give it something systemic or give it some, some sort of uh, residual it, oil it, that goes it, on it. Isn't it sad when you see a dog and it's scratch, 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 oh, scratch, scratch, terrible. poor little thing. No, know? the poor things. And, they, and, yeah. and fleas will just breed like crazy. Oh, boy. And so, uh, no, you definitely have to take mm. some, take care of it. And interestingly, I was just at the Humane Society talking to them about some things, and, and uh, they had mentioned that how important it is to chip your dogs. And what blew me away yeah. was they told me that something like 30% of the dogs that come in get reunited with their owners. I know, it's Isn't fantastic. I was up there well, talking to Pamela Burns about the same thing. Well, what I mean you know, is, though, that 30%, only 30% goes right. back to the owners, but right. all of those are chipped. Yeah. But the ones that aren't chipped, only 30% it, of those get back to their original owners. Chips work. Without <laughs> a chip, you're not going to get, you're that, not going to see the dog. You're not going to see the dog again. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that really made me think about it. It even helps. <laughs> uh, but what about the, what about other things? I mean, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, we're doing all this stuff for, for the, for the animals. What about for the kids? I mean, are, do yeah. we have vaccines in Hawaii that you can, if you live in an area that's susceptible to one thing, can you do something about it medically before the fact? So tropical diseases often don't have vaccines, mm-hmm. and they're often incurable. And mm-hmm. so um, dengue, leptos- leptospirosis, yeah. Lyme fever, malaria. Uh, we don't have malaria, but uh-huh. uh, that, that's one of them. Um, and, and many of these things, you once you get it, you've got it for the rest of your life. You'll never, ever get it away. But the one thing that you mentioned was kids. Yeah. And what does affect kids is asthma as a result of cockroaches. I was going to say, you know, my uh, I, I had later in life latent asthma. But one of my, my mm. brother had asthma when he was a kid and was allergic to a number of things. But there's something about, and you can explain this, there's something about cockroaches. They have this 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 phenom, what, I don't forget, pheromone, whatever you call it. What is that stuff? Pheromone, but it's actually yeah. not the pheromone. It's, what it's, is it? It's, uh, they... they possess triggers that, that trigger allergic reactions and asthma. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> usually it's as a result of their fecal pellets, okay. so their poop, um, their decomposing or dead bodies, and other allergens associated Do with they, them. Does that then become part of particulate and airborne? Exactly, mm-hmm. and, and that's what people breathe, and wow. that's, what, that, yeah. that's what becomes a trigger um, to um, asthma, especially in kids. We actually had to move once when we were kids. My brother was so really? allergic to certain things up in Manoa. We had, my dad had to sell the house. We had to move. Yeah, well, yeah. The, the bad part about that is is that if you have a real bad infestation of mm-hmm. cockroaches and, and you, you come in and you kill them, either you kill yourself or you call a company like ours and we'll come and kill them, mm-hmm. it actually does not remove those allergens. So those ah. triggers that will cause asthma will still be there until they are removed. And so typically in a situation like that, what you'll do is you'd come and you'll do a a roach clean out and then follow up with a vacuum using a HEPA filtered vacuum and we'll suck them out. Yeah, and by the way, that may be, uh, you, a lot of you might think that that's just a gimmick and everything else. There's such a huge, oh, no, that's, uh, that's, wide ver- vein and spectrum now of vacuums. You get what you pay for, right? Oh yeah, no, yeah. We, we use vacuums every day. Yeah, so we have specialized uh, backpack I vacuums see them, yeah. and, uh, and they're real streamlined. The guys can move around easy with them, but we, that's one of our staple things for cockroach and bed bug control. Yeah. There's, think about for bed bugs. Would you rather spray a bed down with pesticides or would you rather just stick a vacuum on and suck it right off the bed and it's gone? Yeah, you know, you, so you, it's so much yeah. easier. And, and by the way, that means that you go through, I guess, enormous uh, experimentation and everything else to develop. And I, and I would imagine first thing somebody says, well, how do you use it? I saw a television commercial, Sandwich Isle Pest Solution television commercial the other day, and it showed your guy in the field uh, doing uh, doing. Uh, 
uh, mosquito prevention or mosquito oh, treatment okay. in a big yard. Yeah. And, and I know that a lot of people think, well, the wind all blows that away. Let's talk about that because some people, even after they discover what where the thing started breeding, they're they're still around. How often do you have to treat for, for so mosquitoes? This, so mosquitoes, yeah. are, are, there's two parts to mosquito treatment. Number one is identifying the source mm-hmm. and treating the source. So if the source is... Um, Let's say a tire is filled with water or yes, potted plants, water company, yeah. then you can easily empty those out, no problem. Mm-hmm. But it might be that it's a marshy area where there's poor runoff and uh, where the water doesn't drain very well, so it's standing water and marshy. So you can have mosquitoes breeding that. So what you can do is you can apply what's called a larvicide. And so we yeah. use it in a granular form. And uh, you throw the larvicide out there, and it's actually a, a, something that will kill the larva of the okay. mosquito. Yeah. So that's different from that's what you'd the, use to kill the adults. That's the future of the problem, right? That's it. So yeah. with any type of fast breeding insect, like any of the fly family, which includes mosquitoes, you really have to control the larvae. You have to find the source and control them at the source. And then you deal with the adult population, so this, the, the, the other component. So the adults are the things that bite you. I, I got to tell you that based on your advice the other day, a couple programs ago, I went through my acreage, which is not really acreage, a little yard, and said, okay, bromeliads, you've come to the end of your, your, your lifespan. When you go, I'm not replacing you. But the good thing is, and I found out from our friend Kevin Mulkern at Mulkern Landscaping, if you are fastidious about maintenance on your bromeliads and you dump them out and rinse them, it's okay. It's when you let them stay that you, you're worried because what you've got is little mosquito farms in every, every plant. Well, you're a much better. You got rid of a bunch. You're a much better you? housekeeper than I am because yeah, I just yeah. got rid of mine. I couldn't deal yeah, with yeah. messing with them anymore. I used to I used to spray them and put granules in them yeah, yeah. to try and break the cycle. But eventually, I either got lazy or, or yeah. just didn't do it enough. You know, and, Michael, uh, I got worried because got somebody, somebody said, to, and I, I'm kidding. I know that we said that in another program, <laughs> but I still have some of the the bronze ones that I really like. So what I've done is. Not many of them, thank goodness. And, and as you know... They're beautiful plants. Yeah, and they don't have yeah. to be in the ground. They can just be in a bucket yeah. or in, in, in a little uh, hollow-tile brick. Yeah. They don't have to grow in the ground. But if you put water in them and dump them out, but it's a pain, you know, and they're sharp and they bite you. And I mean, you know, yeah. they're, they're terrible. No, they are beautiful yeah. plants. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I love them, but uh, too many mosquitoes. Okay, now, uh, one of the things that we need to do um, uh, about uh, uh, how we can do this, we, we are encouraging people to contact us. Uh, how, how do your folks prepare to get uh, contact from you? Do you like? The, are you using the tech, the email technology, or is this is the four five six six seven seven one six still going to get me a human? It's interesting you should say that because I just switched it over so that you dial one for sales, one for two for sales, yeah, yeah, yeah. and three for everything but, else. But at the end of all um, that, one two that, three, you're going to get somebody. That only happens once. Is yeah. one message that takes two seconds yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah. directs you to the right person because you know really just like any other company as you sure. grow um you don't want to have a billing person handling mm. a sales question because a salesperson will get yeah, frustrated yeah. and so what we try and do is try and streamline them but find yes, out where, that, you, where that do you gets, want you know we got 16 people in the office so it's that way it streamlines the correct call to the right person but yes you still get them we 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 love to take calls over the phone because <clears throat> normally that's the easiest way for people to express what the yeah. problem is and i like to i like that human element because they can identify who they're talking to if they like them and, and schedule it right there and then. And um, then the other part, of course, is uh, going on to our website or, or and uh, sandwichisle.com. Yeah, when we come back, uh, we're going to tell you uh, in the waiting parts of the program, here comes summer. Like I said, summer and almost summer. Summer's here. Summer's here for a lot of us right now, and we're going to tell you what you can do to get your place and your family ready for it. Why do you need termite protection? My home is very important to me. Your home is your castle. My home is everything to me. Our customers want to protect their investment. That's why they hire Sandwich Isle to protect their home from termites. There are some homes out there that are going to get termites. You can spend thousands and thousands of dollars to repair damage. You need to protect your house, and Sandwich Isle protects ours. That's Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Expect more and get it. Why do you need pest prevention? My home is very important to me. The last thing I want to worry about are bugs and centipedes around my wife and kids. Your home is your castle. Our customers want to keep their homes free of unwanted pests. That's why they hire Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. There are many homes out there that are going to get rodents. We used to live in fear of centipedes and roaches. You need to protect your house, and Sandwich Isle protects ours. That's Sandwich Isle Pest Solutions. Expect more and get it. And that's why New York, New York, the city, so nice they named it twice. Why I wanted you to get that message twice. It's all a matter of management. 
And we've been talking about time management and a lot of other things with Michael both of today, but the real thing is is to be managed. One thing that I noticed the other day, uh, Michael, before we talk about this summer thing, um, there is a problem um, uh, in Puerto Rico, and, and, and we talked about this before, where there's a, a, a chemical used by a company, uh, Fumigator, that, that was using a pesticide that is banned. And I know how fastidious you guys are, and I hope the whole industry is in the USA. Uh, but there still is a problem with some of the stuff out there. What is it? Yeah, you know, in, in that particular case, it was methyl bromide, which is a, a, it's actually a proven fumigant. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, after the Montreal Protocol, they decided to to reduce uh, manufacture of it and, and make it very difficult to use. Mm-hmm. In certain areas, it's still widely used. Um, in Africa, for example, that is the primary fumigant used to fumigate homes, just like we fumigate yeah, yeah. the drywood too much with sulfuric fluoride here. Pro, pro, so, uh, you know, precautions being you know taken obviously. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's a fantastic fumigant that's been around for the longest time, mm-hmm. but. They believe it's an ozone-depleting agent, so they, they're mm-hmm. pulling it off. Um, but in this particular case, it was misapplied. Yeah. So just like um, misapplying any over-the-counter pesticide, there's potential yeah. for risk when that happens. And so um, it's unfortunate that in this particular case, um, some family uh, who was vacationing in the unit nearby mm-hmm. uh, became the intoxicated yeah. with, with the gas. Yeah. And so you know, I'm sure that uh, the company who was responsible, um, they – of course, didn't didn't plan to do that. It was some applicator who didn't follow the rules, didn't follow the the label, mm-hmm. and ran into that trouble. So the key lesson to be learned out of that is always follow the label. Yep. The, the label is the law, and you have to follow it. How are history. companies like Sandwich Island and others certified to be able to handle these potentially toxic things uh, and, and, and be inspected doing it? So the Department of Agriculture in Hawaii administers this, mm-hmm. and um, basically – for any restricted use pesticide, which is a pesticide that has danger on the mm. label, yeah. you can't buy it over the counter. Okay. You have to buy it from a distributor and you have to have what's called a, a restricted use permit mm-hmm. or a, um, a, a certification that certifies you to purchase it. So uh, there's very few restricted use pesticides around anywhere. Um, and uh, the ones that are, you have to have a certified applicator actually be the person who purchases it yep. and applies it. Okay, this is Mother's Day weekend, as everybody knows, and that means it's summertime, you know. And finally, mom's supposed to get a break, but never, not a break, because moms get awful busy at this time of the year. Michael, outdoors, people come, mommy, something bit me, and all of this stuff. What's going on? What, uh, what, first of all, let's let people know in the bug business, in the pest business, what is summer? Why do you call it, what, what's significant about summer? So the key thing about summer is, summer has all of the ideal factors that allow for easy propagation for an insect so it's it's all the ideal things that an insect needs it's warm it's moist it's sunny it's everything that it needs there's lots of food around for them to really just propagate and and that's why there's all these swarms of insects during summer okay so So, that's like you and i talk about our fishing passion (laughs) it's the perfect storm Exactly. Got all the stuff lining up. The planet's getting lined up to give you misery. Exactly. So <laughs> the interesting thing, though, Mike, is that uh, I was just talking to my kids about it the other day. So in the in the northern hemisphere, of course, our summer is June, July, and August. Mm-hmm. They were blown away when they were talking to some family of ours who are in South Africa, and they found out that the 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 uh, climates were exactly the opposite. Well, the the seasons were exactly opposite. Yeah. And so uh, you know, so in the uh, in the southern hemisphere, um, the period between, between December, January, and February. This summer, right? Exactly opposite from us. Yeah, and that's why you know when you go away, you you, you have to know what to pack. You know, exactly. you, you might leave eighty degrees and get to where it's thirty. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's exactly right. So the the key thing is, um, pests are much much more active. They come out of any dormancy if they're in in, in mm-hmm. a winter dormancy. They're extremely active. It's the time at which they fly to termite swarm to try and create new colonies. And that's the time where you really need to start thinking, what are you going to do to keep the pests out? Because they're going to be flying. So that there's a lot of things you can do. Um, okay, well, here, here's the thing. Here's what I want to do. I love lists. And a, a very dear friend of ours, a dermatologist, he had the mantra in his office. He had a sign that says, uh, check your birthday suit on your birthday. Okay, in other words, take a look at your body for little anomalies. What can you do? What what is there sort of a an implied checklist of, of sort of, Prepping for the summer. You know, we should actually post one on our website, and I'm going to do that. There you I'm go. Just make a note right now. We'll, we'll right make that happen at so, sandwichowl.com. Yeah, so Let's we'll, get we'll go ahead and we'll do that. Yeah. So basically, the key things are keep the insect out. Mm-hmm. So what are the things that you can do to keep them out? Well, um, mostly they're flying insects. 
So um, like mosquitoes and termites and things like yep. that, you want to make sure your screens are perfect. So oftentimes yep. screens tear at the edges. Uh, make sure that those are all fixed up so mm-hmm. that nothing can crawl in underneath it. Then if yeah, you duct at, tape's no good, by the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, then at the bottom of the door, there's like a weather, weather strip yep. or threshold. Make sure that that's tight. Mm-hmm. A mouse only needs a quarter of an inch to get underneath the door. Isn't that trolly amazing? I it's mean, there's so many millions of mice you've caught. How the heck? It's like they're rubber man, right? They no, just get under It's amazing. Yeah. And a rat only needs the size of a quarter. Oh, and goodness. we've got some big, juicy rats. That must be at least say, two pounds. Geez, how do they do that? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, you really have to focus on doing everything to keep them out. A lot of people overlook uh, their dry events. Mm-hmm. So um, we've occasionally found centipedes inside dryers. Well, how do they get yeah, in the dryer? How do they get in there? Through they the vent. They get there through the vent. Yeah. So that nice moist area outside the vent is where cockroaches and things might live. Centipedes come there looking for them. They climb up into the vent, get stuck in the tube, walk out, climb into the dryer, and yeah. then you go and grab your sheets and throw them on your bed. And there you go. Hey, <laughs> you know, i got to tell you yeah. one thing. Since we started doing the program, one of the things that I did when Michael talked about this before is we have a, a, a outside, uh, it's right around the baseboard, uh, a vent for the dryer to, to to blow the lint out, right? Oh, okay. And it has a little trap door on it. And quite some time ago, I think my door fell off. Hey, there was a colony in there. I got a new really? door. I, you know, I got yeah. a new little flapper, and it made all the difference. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Uh, um, we actually found that to be an a common entry yeah. point for rodents. You know why? Because so, it's like a, a three inch pipe. That's some. exactly yeah. it. So yeah. rats, yeah. they look yeah. at that and they're like, "Man, this is just the most perfect little tunnel." They'll yeah. jump inside there. There's lint to keep them warm, and then what will happen is they'll eat through that. And you know where your yeah. washer and dryer is normally next to your dryer. Sure. They'll go to the washer and they'll nibble through the rubber hoses because we've got a bunch of floods in houses as a result. I was going to say floods and how many house fires can we attribute to to uh, rodents eating through wires and causing a short? Yeah, that's right. Okay, Um, so but let's let's make sure that people sort of get this all out. Um, You you talked about uh, you just talked about the the vents and other what about what other holes? So the first part we talked about was exclusion, and one thing we didn't add to that was was um, attic vents. Make sure that you have attic vents that are covered. Because otherwise, birds and all sorts of creatures are going to get inside there. Um, seal cracks and holes around entry points for utility lines. So a lot of people overlook where there might be a cable wire or doesn't take much, does it? Going through, yeah, you know, yeah. and maybe someone had to crack it out and put a new one in, mm-hmm. but never ever yeah. caulked around it or, or set concrete. You know, around can it be pipe. such a simple matter of, of getting a couple of tubes of silicone and just it can be inserted? Yeah. You know, yeah. um, you know, and talking about tubes of silicone. One of the better areas to go for is underneath your siding, where the siding comes down and attaches to the slab. There's often a gap there that sometimes builders mm-hmm. forget to caulk. And so if that hasn't been done, you can get a little mirror and position the mirror underneath the siding and see if mm-hmm. that's been caulked up. If it hasn't, go ahead and caulk it. What about this? You know, I know that uh, you get called a lot when somebody all of a sudden says, you know, at night we're hearing this noise in the attic. We think we have rats. And it turns out that it's really probably not rats. In some cases, it's birds. And, and I think that yeah. some of them, if you look at, along the eaves of any house, you have those little screen things. Yes. That's a door, isn't it? Yeah, the attic vents. Yeah. And so yeah. often, uh, often birds will look around those areas and yeah. peck at them because, because they try and get the geckos. Mm-hmm. And eventually they come out or they'll deliberately go and peck them out so they can get into the attic. Yeah, they're hungry. They're, yeah, they're, and, they're and they'll, resourceful. Well, they'll go in there and it's a perfect place to nest. You know, it's safe, dark. And uh, they're protected. Okay, well, let's make sure before we run out of time on, on this episode of What's Bugging You, um, what your parting message is today. You know, you, you say about uh, one of the favorite things you love to say, there's two kinds of houses here. That's right, two types of houses, <laughs> yeah. those with termites and those that are going to get them. So if you're not doing your annual inspection, you'll be the one that gets them. Yeah, and it, it, it can be as simple as that. And and you will get more and you, and you should expect more. And I think, Michael, that we, we really want people to communicate with us in this show, and so the best way to do that is to go to sandwichowl.com and send us a little yeah, email. Yeah, if you go to com right now, we have a link on there that's that's uh, a button that says What's Bugging You. It'll take yep. you to our page, our What's Bugging You page, and you can post your question there, and we'll read it out the next week. And when we come back next week, we'll bring you more of the good, the bad, and the ugly of pest control and how to deal with it. So for Michael Botha and everybody that drive those 109 trucks now, right? 109, that's a that's great, right. that's a great yeah. number. Thank trucks. you. <laughs> we'll be back again next time. I'm Mike Buck for Michael Botha and everybody at Sam South. Thanks for listening. See you around. Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. And if something is bugging you, jump online and get the bug at sandwichisle.com. That's sandwichisle.com. <laughs>